So Bruce Durling, saving the world with big data, he says. He's a CTO and co-founder of Mastodon C. CTO. CTO. Yeah. And co-founder. You'll see my boss in a second. <laughs> He's also one of the co-founders of the London Clajurians uh -huh. and London Python Dojo. He loves automating drudgery away with a script, learning new language in GNU Emacs, and generally talking nonsense. Mastodon C are agile big data specialists. Mesodon C offers an open source technology platform and the skills to help you realize that potential, and they do it all on zero carbon infrastructure. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I am, as said, Bruce Sterling. Uh, I'm the chief plumber at Mesodon C. <laughs> uh, this is my boss, Francine. <laughs> uh, as you can tell, Francine is a data scientist. I understand. So who else here is a data scientist? Go, raise your hand. Oh, uh, yeah. See? See, all data scientists look exactly like this. So, uh, obviously, you know, it's a bit difficult, you know, working with people like that, but uh, I, I like puppets. What can I say? So, we tend to do stuff like this. We take great big piles of messy data, uh, sometimes from open data, sometimes from closed data, from company data, stuff like that, and we then say, Right, what, what are the interesting questions in here? Let's talk to you, find out what the interesting questions are, and then turn it into a way to communicate that to people. And we do stuff like this. We do stuff like this. This is with sensor data, trying to find uh, people who are uh, lowering their uh, CO2 emissions by doing retrofit stuff and uh, thankfully making their homes more comfortable. But are, are these are these data? This is a beautiful yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Francine would kill me if I ever put a pie chart in. So uh, this is the most recent stuff we're doing. Uh, this is actually for the uh, Connected Digital Economy Catapult. Uh, this is, uh, again, more data from the uh, Health and Social Care Information Center. So this is uh, spend uh, per diabetes patient in the country. Uh, so you can see some places we spend quite a lot, other places we spend less. And uh, hopefully that'll be useful for Diabetes UK, but we're doing some uh, feedback work with them later. And uh, who, who here is in an unsexy startup? Right then. Because what, what's, what's good about unsexy startups is you make money. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? That's so unsexy, that whole making money thing. Uh, but I really like it, because the nice thing about making money is making money means that you can do more of what you like doing. And hopefully, even though you're in an unsexy startup, you still actually... So of the people in the unsexy startup, raise your hand if you're in an unsexy startup. This is very audience inter participation. You, you need to raise your hand where I can't see your hand at all. You're, yeah, 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 there you go. Right. So if, you, if, so if you're in an unsexy startup, do you like being in your unsexy startup? Do you like what you're doing in that unsexy startup? Okay, who hates it? Okay, nobody hates it. Nobody hates it. Okay, that's good. Because if you hate your unsexy startup, go contracting. <laughs> it's a lot, much easier way of earning money. It's a much easier way of earning money. So the nice thing is, is you know, unsexy charges, oh, we, we tend to charge businesses. Why do we charge businesses? Same reason people rob banks. That's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll have to thank Ben Evans for that, who is also in an unsexy startup, uh, Jay Clarity, and they're, they're doing fun stuff as well. Uh, to, uh, I mean, how, how unsexy, so we, we do sexy big data stuff, they're unsexy startup. They tune garbage collection for Java virtual machines. <laughs> He's very good at it. He is very good at it. They're, they're excellent at it. I mean, they are proper rocket surgeons. They are amazing at what they do. And it's great, because what they do, really, really specialist, really, really important if you're doing that kind of thing. And they go in, and they do exactly the right stuff. And they go and do it for businesses. And they do it for businesses because they have money. But the thing is, if you're an unsexy startup, how do you get noticed? How do you get sexy? And there are a couple of different things to do. So it's really tricky trying to trying to do this stuff because you want to make money out of stuff. And by, by making money out of stuff, you know, if, if you don't want to be Facebook and if you don't want to make money by advertising it, and has anybody actually found a model on the internet B2C that isn't actually just giving data to the NSA and advertising? <laughs> Any suggestions from the audience? Malware. Malware, yes. Mal <laughs> malware. So, 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 we, so we've got so we've got government surveillance, uh, business surveillance, and we've got basically blackmail and extortion. Really is what it comes down to. So, 
so that, that's a, that's a problem with a lot of un, with the sexy startups. But how how can we make our startups sexy? So because the problem is that because every I mean everybody wants to work for Facebook, everybody wants to be associated with Facebook. Face you know Facebook get on the cover of magazines and stuff like that. So. Hmm? Yeah, Google, everybody wants to work for Google, yes. everybody wants to work for Twitter, I and mean, these are all sexy startups. And they get noticed. And nobody even notices us in that. I'm, I'm, I'm terribly emotional. Dry your eyes with your profits. That's a good idea. But the thing is, there are other ways of being sexy. And one of the ways of being sexy is, I mean, you know, I'll tell you right now, the reason that I really left doing big dumb enterprise software and big dumb enterprises was I really couldn't take another day of being asked to, can you just use this tool to point and click to do the ETL stuff in talent or something like that. If, if I had to go through another one of those ETL jobs, um, I really was going to stab my eyes out. And uh, okay, 110% of the reason that I started the startup was so that I could code in Clojure all day. So, so who out there is a coder? All right. Who out there does closure? <laughs> oh, the, the Delver guys have run away. Oh, I have one other closure coder. That's disappointing. Who out there codes in a language that they love in their startup? Right? Who doesn't code in a language they love in their startup? Uh, okay. Who who still codes in a language that they hate at their boring corporate job? <laughs> Go start a startup. So. So we do fun tools. So we do Clojure, uh, which is a fun language. Uh, it's a Lisp on the Java virtual machine. It makes my day so much fun. Uh, certainly when we started, there were two of us. And I was the chief plumber, so I was doing most of the coding. Uh, I use Clojure, Francine being a data scientist. She does most of her stuff in R. And if I'm going to be coding 18 hours a day, it would really better be something I enjoy. And, <laughs> And we do stuff on Hadoop, and you know, some, some people say Hadoop is going to be the enterprise Java beans of, of tomorrow, which means it's going to be boring, big, ugly, crufty software. But it, it, it's a lot of fun for now, and there are a lot of things that you can do with it. They're a lot of fun. And the thing is, so who out there in their startup is having trouble hiring people? Okay, are you guys using Ruby, Python, C Sharp? Ruby. Ruby? Ruby? Yeah, Ruby's not fun anymore. <laughs> I have people volunteering to spend time with me, to work a week with me, or work a month with me, because they want closure experience, because closure is that much fun. Who here has had somebody volunteer to spend time free to come and work with them? Really? Wow, what, okay, what, how did you do that? <laughs> well, uh, it was a Christmas project that we were working on, we were using Grails. Right. The team that we worked with, they were predominantly you know, uh, accustomed to Java. Right, so they wanted so, to rescale. Yeah. Exactly, so they wanted to get their hands on a functional programming mm -hmm. language that worked for us uh, for free. We did an internship for three months, and then 80% of them joined their team. So. Excellent. And who, who's the, there was somebody else who said it. So how did, how did you do that? Well, we, we have an internship program, sort of an apprenticeship program, <laughs> and it's amazing how many people get to the end of the interview process and make them an offer, and they're surprised that it's a paid position. Right, so I'm counting that. Excellent. Okay. Uh, that's cheating, but I like the cheating. <laughs> I admire the cheating. Che che cheating is good because when you're in a startup, cheat every chance you can. And when you can't cheat, steal. And when you can't steal, lie. Um, <laughs> so, so we do this kind of stuff, and that means that you know, when it, when it comes to hiring and stuff like that, that there are people who we know who've been around, who've been doing stuff, were involved in the user group. We do that kind of stuff to keep things going. The other thing we do is we do all our stuff open source as much as we can. And uh, is, is anybody out there worried about open source? No, nobody's worried about open source. A lot of people say, open oh, source, how, how can you give everything away? And I usually say, the thing I would like to inflict most upon my competitors is they have to deal with my code. <laughs> it's hard enough for me to get my head around it, and I wrote it. Uh, so, so we use a lot of open source. We contribute to a lot of open source. And, and the other way to make, and then op, op, open source makes you sexy. You'll have to excuse me, I don't know what slide's coming next, that's terrible. So open source makes you sexy because people can see what you're doing. They go, oh, that's the kind of stuff I want to work on. People can contribute to your project and you say, that's the kind of person I want to hire. Somebody, somebody who gives me a pull request on GitHub, 
and can work with me remotely and I can work with them on an open source project. You know, so if they're not volunteering and actually coming in the office, if you're actually working with, with them remotely and they're volunteering their time, that's a great way of doing stuff. And then the last thing to make yourself sexy is to do it right. So the first thing we do, and this is what I mean by do it right. So everybody out there, do, do you all run services and servers, you know, someplace, cloud, co-location, something like that? Who doesn't run servers? Everybody runs servers. Right. This map here. AWS in Virginia. Oh, I've, got, I've got nothing. But it'll sound great on the video, though. So AWS in Virginia is terrible. Look, look at how horrible and red and angry that is. The only thing that's worse than it is Singapore. So what this is, <laughs> and Hong Kong. Just what I want to say. Okay. <laughs> I can certainly justify what I can say. So what this map is showing, this map is showing the amount of CO2 produced per server hour uh, in the world. And so the grid in Singapore is unfortunately very dirty and has a lot of coal on it, as does the grid in Virginia. But Singapore's hotter. As is Melbourne, there's all AWS is bad. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. I use equation to one equation to mix culture. No okay, no, no pollution, just the one equation. Okay, and, and, and you have a little solar panel that you run that on when you actually produce the numbers. <laughs> All right, then. So uh, AWS is bad everywhere except AWS Oregon, which AWS says is zero carbon, and we think they sort of mean it. Rackspace in London, say uh, they have a power purchase agreement, so they say they're zero carbon in London. Green Cloud in Iceland. And uh, there are two data centers in Iceland. So the nice thing about Iceland is uh, basically they have three aluminum smelting plants and they have a lot of hydrothermal, hydro and a lot of geothermal power. And basically their energy, so, so the UK energy is like this. And then Coronation Street happens and there's spring <laughs> Coronation Street and it goes like that and then it goes back down again after everybody's turned off their kettles in Coronation Street. And then there's another bit right afterwards where everybody flushes their toilet, but that's the water, not the power. Um, but Iceland, They've got three aluminum smelters on the island and no people, so the power is just like that. <laughs> so they have one of the most reliable and uh, greenest uh, power grids in the world. It's a little bit slow, but if you're doing big data stuff, if you're doing stuff with Cassandra, you want to be a little bit careful. You know, so, sometimes there are your latency matters, but most of the time if you're doing big, big data stuff, a couple extra milliseconds of latency isn't really going to make that big of a difference. So run your stuff where it's good. And the thing is, is then all of a sudden you can say, yeah, we're a big, unsexy startup, but we're a social enterprise now. Why are you a social enterprise? Well, because we're doing all our, all our data crunching for all our customers in a zero carbon way. Congratulations. All of a sudden, you're now a sexy social enterprise. And that's good. And apart from anything, it keeps from destroying the planet, which I'm quite happy. This, this is the stuff we do. I'm very conscious that I'm between everybody and beer. Um, so, and that's me. Any questions? Um, what are these for visualizations? So all the maps and... Um, uh, so the maps at the moment are in uh, Leaflet. Primarily, uh, we're, we're looking at doing some stuff with that because we're doing some stuff. Uh, we're looking at using uh, Mapbox and some of the tile mill engines as well. Uh, but for smaller maps where things aren't too complicated, leaflet.js is really, really good. Uh, most, uh, all the other database stuff is in D3 because I'm not a designer and D3 makes my stuff look nice. And if D3 is too hard, there's dimple.js, which is a really nice wrapper around D3. And there's another wrapper around D3, which is actually a grammar of graphics around D3 called uh, Vega, which is from a company called Trifacta. Anything else? Oh, You're yeah. using Kixi as your video platform. Yes. So, so Kixi is a number of things together, and Kixi includes Hadoop, um, but because the, the big data platform we have is that people bet generally have a great big mess of data over here that they don't know what to do with. So the first thing is to actually ingest that data 
into, for us, it's some sort of S3-like store into HDFS. And so there's the bit of Kixie that does all that pipelining of getting it from web services or getting it from SFTP or getting it from places and actually getting it into some place that Hadoop can do it. And then there's the bit of Kixie that actually starts up and shuts down the Hadoop clusters and submits the jobs to them. And then there's the bit of Kixie that says, okay, now the data is there, we probably have to put it someplace into either a website or into a database or something like that. So, so Hadoop is a big chunk of it. But some, for some of our clients, the, their data is not big enough to need Hadoop. Um, they might need Redshift, and we use uh, Amazon Redshift for some of our clients, or they, they might need Elasticsearch or something like that. But you know, if it's only growing so fast that we can get away without all the moving parts of Hadoop, then we don't use it. But the nice thing is we absolutely scale up to it. So from a business perspective, do your customers share preference on you guys being open source or using a particular platform? Um, so I mean, it, it, def it definitely becomes a problem thinking about the platform and stuff like that. Uh, the open source is partly a hedge because we're small and we're young. So we can say to people, so the reason we're keeping your business is because you like working with us and we stay in business. And if you don't like it, it's all open source, it's all yours. You know, the bits that aren't open source, you own. So you can go and take it to another vendor if you want to, but we think you'll stay with us because we give you good service. And so that that seems to sort of, you know, you're, wait, you're, you're five people? Yeah, really? And you say, no, 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 if you, if you don't like it, you know, your coders can take it over and stuff like that. There, there is a problem. Some people like Microsoft stuff and that. That gets true. <laughs> so with, um, with Clojure, have you managed to, to um, leverage the kind of back-end and front-end, same language with Clojure and Clojure scripts? Does that, does that really work out in the real world? We're that close to Clojure script. Um, the problem is, is D3 is awesome. And there's a closure script version called C2 that does most of it there, but doesn't have quite the community that D3 has. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest thing that's actually keeping us off closure script at the moment. But I have a feeling that at some point, now the core async is out. And there are a lot of things with some of the more recent advances in closure script that are actually really, really cool and make it so much easier to build amazing interfaces for people and just trying to write some of that code that you can write really easily in Clojure Script using Core Async, trying to write some of that in CoffeeScript, JavaScript, something like that, I just, I die. I'm not that smart. Anything else? From a competitive uh, competition's perspective, what is your, what is your experience been? Because you know, there's so many big data tools out there. The customers obviously, you know, Kind of shown a lot of tools, a lot of technologies. You know, what's the key USP here? Is so it the people, is it? So, so the key USP that we have is that for the most part, we, we take we take the problem away for people because a lot of people are saying use our big data tool, use our big data tool, use our big data tool, and then they're saying right. So now I have to hire people who know your big data tool. Okay, where do I find people who know your big data tool? And we say no, 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 no. Give us your big data and then we'll give it back to you in something that makes sense to you from a data warehouse or a MySQL database or Elasticsearch or a website or whatever. And they go, oh, great, cool. You're actually solving my problem for me. And the nice thing about that is, is that means that you add a couple of zeros on the correct <laughs> side of the decimal point. <laughs> so you're like a big data consultancy. So we have a pro so it's a bit like Salesforce and Oracle and that Salesforce and Oracle both have a product, but have a professional services arm as well that tackles some of the interesting stuff. We also have some partner organizations we work with to scale up when we need to. And also there are some things, not quite yet because we're a bit young, but soon we're sort of hoping that they'll actually be able to take stuff on and build stuff on our platform after we build things with them a couple of times. And that's so sort of the ecosystem that we want to build. Yeah. For, yeah. yeah, so there, there's Kixie Pipe and Kixie Cloud and the stuff that actually spins things up and goes and gets things off and stuff like that then a couple of canned things when we know what the data sources are going to be like. But then the actual configuring of that for a customer tends to be a professional service. Engagement. And from a business model point of view, it's really nice. It's, we'll go and talk to you, we'll work out strategy with you, and then we'll go and do a build piece for the custom bits on top of the platform. And then there's running the platform onwards. So there's a nice big chunk of money up front, and then there's subscription money after that, which helps a lot with cash flow. And it works for Oracle, works for Salesforce. So. I don't yeah. see, you know, that, 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 that's part of the stealing. <laughs>
Yeah, I guess it's that going from unsexy startup, which I really love the concept of, to what can great massive technology company, yeah. you know, which is the... Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, 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 uh, I'll come back to you. Are there any QA challenges that you now face in the big data world that you would say are distinct from the uh, QA type challenges that you faced when you were a big data guy? So the thing is, is, I've always been a big data guy, but when I started with big data, it was talking to a mainframe, and then it was talking to the biggest Oracle database that money could buy. And now, instead of giving a million pounds to IBM or to Oracle, I give two pounds fifty or two dollars and fifty cents to Amazon, which is really nice. Um, well, I'd like that money myself, but anyways, you know, I'm mean like that. But what's nice is with some of the, so there are a lot of tools out there uh, with Hadoop in particular that make it really difficult to test this kind of stuff. Uh, the nice thing, and part of the reason why we chose the technology we did, is that testing for Cascalog, which is the library that we use in Clojure that we use to do Hadoop, is actually really, really easy for doing unit testing on. So we can actually do sort of proper BDD testing, proper unit testing, and all our stuff is nice decomposable functions and stuff like that. And so we, we still do the testing. Uh, the only thing that becomes a problem is that, you know, sort of the and when you put it on to the server, when you just have that many moving parts, things fail in weird ways, which is one of the reasons why, you know, talking about before, you know, the whole, you know, is Hadoop always in there? Hadoop is in there when it needs to be, but when we don't need to do it, when we don't need that many moving parts, then we, then we take those moving parts out. I'm very interested in solving big data issues. So I'm interested in collecting what those issues are. Mm -hmm. If anyone's got any, bring them to me. Yeah, and I, I would say have, have a look at uh, Cascalog, cascalog.org, and have a look at how it does testing with Midge, which is from Brian Merrick, who's done lots of BDD stuff and has a good experience and background in BDD and Java and other languages. So, that's um, so you mentioned that you kind of solve problems uh, by kind of ingesting the big data, mm -hmm. testing it and stuff, uh, but as mentioned in the previous talk, didn't you find, um, or have you ever found, the problems that clients don't want to you to look at the data, especially being a Python startup? Uh, yeah, so I mean, that, that is a problem. I mean, you know, there are NDAs, there are security, there are enterprise security bits and pieces. Um, one of the things is, is we're relatively small, so we don't necessarily have to take on everything. The other nice thing is that a lot of the cloud decisions and stuff like that, it tends to be a jurisdiction of whether or not you're going to run it in the EU or whether or not you're going to run it in the UK or whether or not you're going to run it in Switzerland. But having, so before, before I did this, I used to sell Salesforce stuff, and I was doing Salesforce sales uh, and development and consulting to investment banks. So having that argument about cloud is something that I'm already used to doing. And the trick around that, so it's, it's, so it's steal, cheat, lie, <laughs> uh, and backstab. This is the one I forgot. And basically what you do is you go around the IT department and you go and sell directly to the people who actually have value out of the data that they want to extract. And they'll usually say, no, I want to do this and I want to accept the risk. And that, that's who you want to do, because a business person at the top can say, this is valuable enough. And you guys have told me, yes, sir, there are these risks, but I'm willing to accept that risk as a part of what we're going to do. Therefore, we're going to do it. Whereas if you go through the IT department, the IT department will just say, no. And, bu and bump you back because they're, they're, they stop at the risk and there's no upside for them. There's, there, there's only efficiency for the IT department, whereas if you go to the business, they're saying, no, my upside makes it worth this risk. Yeah, sorry, so the, the, the closure thing. So for a, a, my last large clients, mm -hmm. they don't want closure. Why? It's a new language. It's another thing we've got to think about. We don't want it because yeah. you know, we've got enough languages. Why do we need another one? So closure just gets stopped straight away. Yeah, yeah. Closure gets stopped straight away. Do I just say, oh, we've worked with JDM languages? So actually, one of the things I found is when I go in and say closure, and this is usually a good sign of whether or not we're going to have a good time with a client or something like that, is I go in and say closure, and I, I run the user group and stuff like that as well. Because they say, oh, yeah, I've been doing closure my spare time. I really like it. You do the mind stuff on there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the, this, this is a JDM language you're happy with. <laughs> right. I think beer. Beer? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you.